where best friends and next door neighbors, Willow and Lillian, spill the tea on murder, mysteries, and other things that go bump in the night. So get your favorite teacup ready and let's get into it. Welcome to Cruelty Podcast. This is Lillian, and with me is Willow. Hello. So, today's episode is uh, rough. Yeah. And I will we'll do trigger warnings and all that. I don't want to even banter ahead of time, and I don't want a business time on the end of something so somber. So, I'm going to get it out of the way first. Yeah. Y'all don't worry. It's going to be less than two minutes. So, mm. I mean, if you want to skip ahead a minute or two, feel free. Right. Uh, but here, basically, I want to talk about our Patreon a little bit. Mm-hmm. First Just of all, updates. thank you all for your support. It means the world. Uh, we release a Patreon exclusive episode. Every week. It is late this week because both me and Willow have had personal life stuff that I don't even want to talk about. Not even necessarily bad. It's just been a lot. Yeah. And so. Yeah. This week's episode was supposed to be released on Father's Day. It's still a Father's Day episode. Um, It's the story of Gary Plache. Um, If you know, there's been a meme going around for Father's Day. And so I just wanted to kind of give you guys the story behind that meme since it's been going around. And it's like a vigilante justice case. Yeah. Yeah. I will be covering, in addition to the victims of Israel Keys, I am also covering the Scott Peterson case. And you may say, oh, Lillian, that's been done to death. However, there is a current disinformation campaign by his family and lawyers releasing TV specials, interviews. You can see it on Reddit. The tide has turned where people believe he's innocent. And they have a lot of claims that on face value make it seem like, yes, maybe he is innocent. Excuse me. I am going to go through point by point debunking this horseshit. Y'all are not going to want to mint this episode. I have I can't tell you how many countless hours of research and books I've read. I am ready to eviscerate and take down with with like no mercy. And you're going to I'm not going to be unhinged. But you're not going to want to miss it. Mm. In addition, I've been doing a lot of tarot readings. I'm running a couple specials. And if you're interested in getting a reading and finding out what those are, please contact me. My email will be in the description. But other than that, I would really like to just get started. So, Willow, what are the trigger warnings for this episode? Um, well, this is caught on camera month, so there's some of it that's caught on camera, but not any parts of the actual crime. Um but the trigger warnings for this case, y'all, I'm having the worst emotional, physical reaction just to the research of this case. Um, I'm talking rapid heart rates, hard to breathe. Um, I was getting really dizzy learning some of the facts on this case. So if you if you are sensitive in any way to this type of material, please be aware um, of your own physical abilities to to get through this um but specifically being the trigger warnings of sexual assault and murder and descriptions of assault and wounds and the fact that this happened to such a sweet and innocent child yeah this is gonna be rough <clears throat> aliana defries was a 14 year old girl who was mentally very young for her age She was small. She was less than five feet tall. She had bright eyes and a big smile. She played with Barbies and baby dolls, which she sadly got picked on and made fun of for in school. One day she came up to her father and she told her, told him, quote, daddy, my friends in school talk about me because I tell them I still play with dolls. And he said, quote, well, those aren't your friends. You stay a child as long as you want to stay a child. She was in special education. She took medicine every day for her mental illness, though I couldn't find exactly what she was diagnosed with. And since I couldn't find it, I'm going to assume that that information is kept private for reasons that I respect. But no matter what, she was an innocent and kind, shy little girl who was still eager to make friends. She was silly, she was happy, and she was playful. And most of all, she was extremely loved. Her parents weren't together, but they more than co-parented her. Her mother 
um, Denisha Cooper and her father, Damon DeFries, and his wife, Watanya DeFries. They all... They all work together. She was called her other mother, not the stepmother. I love that. Um, and she helped raise her from the age of three. So it was it was definitely a, a together um, of a family that co-parented and lived not in the same house, but they lived together. Um, uh, Denisha's mother lived with her as well, so she had her mama, her pa- her daddy her other mother and her grandma all right there with her. I love that very it was much. Absolutely beautiful. Um, she would basically alternate between the two houses. Her father called it a party because every single day was celebrated every single day. They lived in Cleveland, Ohio, which is a place that we talk quite a bit, quite a lot about on this podcast. Um, yes, we do. I have covered so many cases from Cleveland, Ohio that I still get, Cleveland, Ohio, like dot com updates every single day when I wake up. Sometimes um, my weather app will switch to Ohio. Yeah. Because of yeah. that. Yeah. And I just got to say, like, my heart goes out to the families and the communities of Cleveland. Um, I can only imagine how terrifying it is because, you know, during this case, a lot of other people were going missing and a lot of other murders were happening. And I can just imagine how terrifying it is. Um, And how strong of a community you'd have to be to support each other through this, uh, which it really does show in this case, just how much support she had. Um, Aliana rode the city bus to school every morning, as as did other children that she went to school with. For some reason, there wasn't enough school buses in their district, and the city bus route was the only option for her, which if you've ever ridden a city bus, uh, you usually have to get on and off several different stops in order to get to your destination um, because city bus routes are usually on a, a specific route, right? Yes. So, you know, you kind of have to like stone skip through. You have to really know your streets and you have to really know like your bus routes and your times and all of this. It can be really confusing. And Cleveland's a big city. Yes, yes. yes. And um, this is a little girl. So... Um, yeah, just I, I've ridden the city bus. I don't know how many times, and um, it, it does get really confusing. It gets really confusing. I mean, man, they, if you miss your bus, mm-hmm, you have to sit there and wait mm-hmm. forever for the next. Well, one. and you have to know ahead of time what buses land in certain areas and when. Like, yes. if you don't have your map on you with your schedule, you have to know ahead of time so that way you know which bus you can catch. Um, yeah, it can just be really, really confusing for an adult, much less a sleepy child who you know just woke up and is on her way to school. But Aliana didn't seem to mind. Independence can be fun, especially when you're young. Her father was concerned. He warned her not to wear her earbuds so she could hear her surroundings. He taught her not to have her hood up so she could see better, to always be watchful and never walk close enough to someone who could grab you. He just knew how dangerous it could be out there, and he was desperate for his daughter to stay safe. But absolutely no preparation could have helped in this terrible situation. I'm sure her parents are riddled with the what ifs and what could have happened as a as any parent would have. Her father, Damon, and her mother, Denisha Cooper, have been huge targets of blame. And I cannot imagine their pain to not only lose their child in such a horrific way, but to also be blamed while grieving. I think my heart would actually stop beating from the pain. I just cannot imagine that. No. Um, I really do hope that that their family and loved ones received the support that they definitely deserve. Uh, because on January 26th, 2017, it was a freezing cold morning. Aliana's mom, Denisha, walked her up to the bus stop just like she did every single morning. She told her that she loved her. She gave her a big hug and a kiss goodbye. And just as she did every other day, But on this day, Aliana did not get off the school bus like normal. This time, she was nowhere to be found. Denisha's heart just sank. She was instantly terrified. Her daughter was on routine constantly. She never wavered from her routine. She was like clockwork. She was always on time and extremely punctual. Denisha called the school and found out that her daughter had never made it to school that day, though she was never notified. She, she called Aliana's other mother, Watanya, 
hoping that maybe she had picked her up from school or something, but she hadn't seen Aliana. So she instantly hung up the phone and called 911. Officers were, officers were sent to her house immediately, and they began an investigation. Now, one aspect, I guess a silver lining, if you will, if there is one about this case, is that these investigators, the police officers in the investigation, did their due diligence. They worked hard for Aliana. This Good. is something that we do not see in most cases. No. In most cases, they would say, oh, a 14-year-old girl, she's a she runaway. She ran away, yeah. No, they were instant, instantly okay. at her well, house. Well, props to them. Absolutely. Um, I, it was actually baffling to me that, that I, I, I had never heard of someone acting like this for a missing child. Um, and it's sad. It's sad that it's rare. But Cleveland PD and the detectives on this case just worked tirelessly to bring Aliana home. Police first contacted Aliana's school, and they, you know, found out that she had not been there all day. They asked the administrator what kind of child Aliana was, if she was the type to skip school or play hooky, and they said absolutely not, that she was never late, and she even wanted to go to school on the days that she was sick. The fact that she hadn't shown up to school that day made her teachers worried, but for some reason, none of them contacted her parents or guardians. I find that really strange. It's very sad. <sighs> It's devastating to the case, honestly, because if they would have been notified, something could have been she most likely would have been found. The search party ensued while investigators back at the station contacted the city bus companies, hoping hoping that maybe they had some sort of surveillance videos that might have some sort of clues as to where she had went. But all that takes time to get all all the tapes transferred over to the station. So in the meantime, not just the police and the detectives, but the whole entire block, the entire community was working together to find Aliana. Her parents can't just sleep through the night. It's freezing and it's starting to snow and their daughter is out there somewhere. They called everyone they could think of and started a telephone chain to get the word out. And together they formed this massive search. They checked every local hangout spots, restaurants, alleyways, abandoned buildings, car parks, and wooded areas. You name it, they searched it. They weren't about to stop until Aliana was found. The next day, the video footage came from the bus station. It's in black and white when the interior lights are off, but you can see very clearly that Aliana is entering the bus around 6.40 a.m. when her mother said that she last saw her. She's exactly as her mother described. She has a blue headscarf protecting her braids, her coat, her uniform. She has her hood down, just like her father told her to. And once she gets on the bus, she puts on her headphones and she comes up to the bus driver and smiles as a boy her age enters the bus. The two talk and they clearly know each other. They sit next to each other for a while. Investigators hope that maybe this is a boyfriend that her parents don't know about. Maybe they ran off together and they're okay. But then she gets off the next stop and the, bu the boy stays on the bus. Um, and, you know, she usually catches an another stop after this. And she even told the boy, like, yeah, I'm, I'll, me I'll meet you at school. Like she was intentionally going to school. So the buses have a set of three cameras. It has one facing the door so you can see people as they enter and exit. There is another camera inside the bus so you can see down the length of the interior of the seats and one on the exterior of the bus that has a street view. So they looked over the two interior cameras and then they gathered the footage from the exterior of the bus, hoping that maybe they can catch something as the bus drives off in the same direction that Aliana is walking. So maybe they can get a street view because they kind of right. drive alongside each other for a second. So they see her walking forward towards the next bus stop at the next intersection. They slow it down and watch several times scanning every second to see if they can see anything strange or significant. Right on the edge of the frame, you can see a man in a light colored hoodie carrying two bags walking towards her. It's not much, but it's something. So they follow the lead. They check to see with the second bus that she was supposed to get on to see if there's any video footage of her possibly boarding the bus or anything that might have happened outside of the bus. And it shows Aliana getting on the bus. She got on that second bus. Wow. And the man who was supposedly following her did not get on that bus. Okay, so it wasn't so him. It, it wasn't him. It was just a man walking by. Um, and this bus was the bus that should have taken her to school. And she had expectations of going to school. Right, because she told the kid. Right. Yeah. But it is dark time. It is dark 
It is January and it is starting to snow. And it's very likely that she got confused because she accidentally gets off the bus two stops early. Oh, poor baby. No one knows why. Um, it very well could have been an accident. But on January 29th, 2017, three days after searching frantically across Cleveland, police narrowed down their search to the neighborhood near the bus stop Aliana was last seen at. It was a street that was mostly um, old, abandoned houses, derelict and falling apart, boarded up windows and weathered spray painted tags all along these falling apart buildings. Many of them had been scavenged through and picked apart for all the scrap metal available left to rot. They went house to house searching for every searching every single building. Most of them were in pretty scary conditions. They didn't know if they were going to come across squatters or a killer or a body or broken floorboards and crumpling walls. They had no idea what they were about to find as they entered that's really scary houses. because of all the has like people mm. don't understand abandoned houses are really hazardous really especially hazardous. if they've been around for a while yeah especially older houses especially these houses because all of them have pretty much the same layout as a lot of the other cleveland like there's so many houses in cleveland that i already know the layout because of other cases that i cover right and all of the cases are all of the houses on the street look very similar to those a lot like the cleveland house of horrors yeah where you that's have exactly what i was thinking of they all talking. look like that house um just different colors and shapes but yeah they all have like basements and then are usually two stories so yeah there's a lot of just physical um dangers that these officers could be in and and also it's not just officers searching right they have the whole community with them as well um but luckily it's three officers that ended up going into this house that was just a, a couple houses up from the bus stop officers walked into this abandoned house and instantly didn't feel right there was no electricity or running water and it was pretty rough shape officers walked in with their flashlights and their beams catch a trail of blood and a bloody footprint. They followed it into a room where they found bloody discarded clothing, a tool bag with many tools that had blood on them, mm. both in the bag and throughout the room on the floor. Further into the room in the dark closet, they found the bloody and badly beaten, mangled, nude body of a little girl. Everyone knew in their hearts that it was Aliana. They took samples, but they had to wait for a positive identification of the victim before alerting the family, because obviously a protocol, yeah. but also B, there are so many missing murdered and people in this area that they had to make sure that this wasn't a different homicide or different missing person. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Think about the workload that these officers have. And the diligence that they're taking to every single case. I, I, <laughs> I don't say this often, but I'm really proud of these officers. One of the members of the search crew ended up finding out that these officers found a body in the specific house. And even though the officers weren't going to contact the family, this person contacted the family immediately. And her other mother, Watanya, showed up at the house. And she was just begging to see. She was like, look, you don't have to show me her. You don't have to show me her body. You can show me her jacket, her backpack, anything that belonged to her. And I can identify her through anything. And they couldn't do that. It's just really brave and desperate and sad. But they couldn't do that because it all was contaminated with her blood. God. They couldn't take a single item of hers from that scene. Because it was evidence. Because it was brutal. Yeah. Aliana was identified through her dental records. Trigger warning. Her autopsy report. Showed that she had been sexually assaulted multiple times. Multiple times. Tortured. Beaten to death. There were so many wounds on her body that could have been fataled, fatal that they could not determine which one of them actually killed her. Again, trigger warning, you might want to skip ahead because I do feel like these details 
are important um, for her own justice. Aliana's throat was slit. Her jaw was broken. There were five drill holes in her face. Oh, God. One in her forehead, which dislodged her eye. This baby was alive when this was done to her. She had several other tool marks and stab wounds across her body from various items that they found in the house, including a screwdriver and a box cutter. In what would be the dining room of the abandoned house, they found a table covered with blood with a drill, a box cutter, a screwdriver, and a hammer neatly laid out. My God. Police recovered a, a footprint in blood and a semen sample for testing. Meanwhile, they canvassed the area looking for any buildings with surveillance that could have possibly captured what happened to Aliana. A church across the street had a camera with a clear view. At 7.13 a.m., they could see Aliana walking down the sidewalk. She's kind of walking slowly and playfully with long, wide, airy strides, um, almost as if she's skipping or listening to music. It looks like she's having a really good time. She doesn't seem scared what, whatsoever. She just seems like a kid walking down the street. As she gets to the end of the corner at a four-way intersection at the very edge of the camera's view, they see her look up at a man standing at the corner. He looks like he's saying something to her and she jumps back. But the snow picks up and it's hard to make out what the man looks like. But Aliana walks on and the man end up following her. It's snowing, which again makes it very hard to see specific details, but they get the footage from a second camera from a different angle. And it's actually focused on the parking lot, so most of the camera view is the parking lot. But at the very top of the frame, you can see Aliana's legs, and you can see her walk, stop, and then jump back as the man follows and then walks with her away. She then, at the very top of the screen, you can barely see it, but she then crosses the street, and then the man grabs her from behind and leads her to the right off the screen. And it's very grainy, and it's very hard to see exactly what is happening. But one thing is very clear. These are the last moments of Aliana's life. Footage taken from yards away from where her body was found. Now, detectives have to go backwards, right? They have to, yeah. you know, retrace this, this man's step. They know where he was at this point in time. So Let's, that means they can find footage from elsewhere to find out where he is. Or, like what they actually did, was they just looked at those church cameras from earlier that morning. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah, because before it started snowing, it had a, they had a better, clearer And he's view. clearly waiting there for somebody. Girl, at 5 a.m., two hours earlier, oh he God. is seen walking, pacing, pacing that city block, just walking up and down, He's up trying and to down. find somebody. He is searching. He is looking everywhere. He's not looking down as he walks. He has his hands in his pockets. He's a predator looking for his Those brain. tools were planted. At that building. He was ready. He was ready, searching for two hours. My God. I don't think that's the first time he's done this. No, not at all. And that's exactly what investigators thought. Absolutely. Too practice, too easy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Many phone calls came in from tips from women in the area who said that they had been approached by a man fitting this description and circumstances. Um, they... So, yeah, they, the, the video camera, the evidence that they got from 5 o'clock, it did show a very clear image of what he looked like. He's bald. He's taller. He has a beard. Um, very big, broad shoulders. Very tall man. Um, now, with the severity of the crime, as well as the way that the man seemed to be searching for a victim, yeah, it definitely seemed like he had done this before. And so they started going through the registered sex offender database and realized that there's just an extreme amount of sex offenders in this area. So searching through this very long list uh, was going to be time consuming. So while they did that, they you know, were also waiting for DNA results to come back. The city of Cleveland is just mourning. They're, they're mourning 
this loss. The abandoned house became a memorial and loved ones gathered to pay respects and leave behind stuffed animals and comfort items for her soul to rest with. Such an earth shattering loss, the cries from the breaking hearts just echoing down the empty streets. The weight of this pain was so heavy that many of her family members just collapsed. Their knees couldn't hold their body up and they just fell to the ground, sobbing in tears, just holding each other. At her funeral, um, the police officers on her case were her pallbearers. And um, I think for once, we get to see a positive example of men in uniform protecting and serving their community. They wanted to make sure that because this man has not been found yet, that this little girl is placed in the ground and, and watched over and taken care of and isn't being carried by somebody who could have done this to her. Um, just absolutely heartbreaking. Can't imagine. Finally, detectives narrowed down their search to a man fitting the description, the vicinity of the crime, and DNA evidence came back confirming that 44-year-old Christopher Whitaker was their main suspect. He was a registered sex offender. In 2005, he was sent to prison for four years. Four years. For... Now, he had um, he had just walked up to this woman's home, knocked on the door, asked to use the restroom. When her back was turned, he took a pair of scissors, stabbed her in the neck and sexually assaulted her. Jesus Christ. He was given four years, four years for attempted murder and sexual assault. I'm saying. Ooh. And this man's mugshot was identical to the man on the video. This was their guy. Now, um, being their prime suspect and highly dangerous and extremely large man, um, he stood over well over six feet tall, was almost 300 pounds of pure fucking muscle and rage. OK, this man was huge, like towered over all of the officers. None of the officers wanted to go arrest him like they were all terrified. Yeah, like, don't blame him. Fuck. Yeah, they had to call in the U.S. Marshals and the Northern Ohio Violent Fugitive fugitive task force wow to come get this man they said that whenever they opened the door one of the officers said that a mountain of a man stood before them he said that when he grabbed him to put on his handcuffs he felt like he was touching pure evil he said that the, his wrists were so large that the handcuffs only made it two clicks and that it, likely if he flexed he could just break out of it Aliana was less than five foot tall and about a hundred pounds. Now, to think of the amount of force that this huge man released upon this fragile girl is just heartbreaking. I really hope the devil makes a special room for him. You know, I, I went on this whole tangent, uh, maybe the start of this month into last month, how, you know, it's not monsters, it's human beings. But in this case, girl, I don't know. Girl. This doesn't, like, it yeah. just doesn't even seem human. I can't imagine mm -mm. brutalizing mm -mm. a child mm -mm. that way. Mm -mm. I, can't, I can't fathom it. No. It is to the depths of, dep like, degradation and, I, and evil I do not understand. I have linked the interrogation video, and I listened to the entire thing um, to my own detriment. I... Did I still feel ill after just listening to that man speak because he is well spoken. He is not delirious. He is of sound mind, quote unquote. Um, he he that's knows how to scarier. lie. You that's know what I'm saying? That's even fucking scarier. Yeah, that's the thing is that uh, we'll get into like he the actual He knows how trial. to pretend to be a human being. He's a fucking liar. He's just he's just a blatant and compulsive liar. And he is. Um, yeah. I don't like to use the word monster when we're talking about a human being because I want to humanize people for the yes. evil that they do. But this man. Yeah, he's a monster. Yeah. Yeah. Now, when they first brought him in for questioning, he denied any involvement. He talked and talked and talked and officers just let him talk. They didn't correct him or anything. They asked him questions, but they just basically Smart. let him talk. Yeah. Hang himself. They were really good. Arrogant with this. piece of shit. Oh, it was bad. I definitely, if you have the stomach, definitely. Listen. I don't think I can handle it. Just going to be honest. It's, it's rough. Um, I just don't want to hear his voice. So yeah, he, he basically like tries to say like 
he basically makes up what his day to day life is like, oh, I don't even wake up until like 10 or 11. And then I do this and blah, blah, blah. He's like, you know, makes up these stories that definitely doesn't put him anywhere near the crime at all. Um, but investigators just let him talk himself into circles, clearly saying things that did not match physical evidence that they collected. Um, like he said that there were other people there, like as they talked him into, you know, s catching himself and realizing, oh, wait, no, 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 your your DNA evidence was actually found in this house. So then he had to explain why his D DNA might be found in that house. And of course, he he, you know, tried to claim a lesser offense of blur burglary, trying to say, oh, I was just stealing this for scrap metal, blah, blah, blah. That might have been how my DNA got there. Um, just talking himself into circles. And then they were like, well, your DNA was was semen, sir. Like, yeah, like ha you didn't just whoopsie. Yeah, and it was actually found inside of the victim. So how do you how do you you know place yourself there? Then he tried to implement other people involved in this crime. He tried to say that all these other people were in the house that he just kind of walked in, jerked off, and then walked out. Like like that was even a thing. And they were like, you know, obviously, clearly you didn't because here's a picture of your shoe print and fresh blood. So. Um, but yeah, he, they just kind of allowed him to talk himself into circles. And once the DNA and surveillance videos were shown to him, like, here's the evidence we have you placed here. Then he just crippled and he ended up completely admitting everything that he had done. Um, well, not everything, just admitted to doing whatever he had done. And, and then immediately started to backpedal and say, well, I was high on crack um, you know, basically trying to, to claim diminished capacity and saying that, you know, I was just really high. Um, I didn't know what I was doing. And then all of a sudden, you know, he tried to say this really long apology that was just really, really hard to hear because obviously it was fake. And then at the end of his apology, he says, quote, people are going to look at me like a monster. I am not a monster, just an addict who made a mistake that shouldn't have happened. Sir, you're not an addict. I mean, you might be an addict, but that's... I've no. known lots of addicts in my life. I've known many. Um, and I don't know any that would fucking do that shit. No, no that's not, that's not, not the even crime a of an addict. Mm -mm. How dare you? Mm -mm. Absolutely. How dare you take somebody else's pain and mental illness and claim it as your reasoning for doing that to a girl. No, we don't get that excuse. No, no. Uh -uh. Especially being so eloquent and good with your words three days after. No, no. A fucking psychopath. No. Yes, exactly. So, yeah, he went on and on and on and really tried to milk out sympathy from the investigators. Like, he was like, oh, I wish I was dead. Like, I really feel bad. Like, all this really just disgusting behavior. Um, and I just I really don't find any sympathy or empathy for this man. Um, he clearly knew what he was doing and evidence showed that it was premeditated, that he had planted his tools there. He knew what he was doing. Um, no, 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 no. So months later, during the investigation, 2017, um, Aliana's parents established the Aliana DeFries Let's Make a Change Foundation. It's a nonprofit organization that focuses on child safety by lobbying for, for safer transportations to schools, organizing more police presence on the streets, and cleaning up the streets where children walk. In Aliana's name, children just like her are now able to access free and safe rides to and from school. Her father, Damon DeFries, said, quote, with this foundation, we are making a change to demolish abandoned structures, address homelessness and police and community relations to make sure our children are safe. They are just doing amazing work, absolutely amazing work in her honor. And I think that um, she would be proud of them. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Now, the trial took place. Um, it, it, it took several months to get through this trial uh, with him not admitting fault until his life was literally on the line. And then he tried to offer a plea deal of guilty with exchange for life in prison without parole instead of the death sentence. But the jury wouldn't have it. 
Good. Uh, they wanted his life, and so did the judge. And Aliana's family had to sit through every single hearing, listen to all the evidence, seeing all the crime scene photos, the pictures of her having to listen to his statements. Her grandmother said, quote, I can see the evil that's in him and that and we should. Sorry. And we have to tell everybody this is what evil looks like. In 2018, Christopher Whitaker was sentenced to death for 10 other or for 10 other counts, including aggravated murder, plus additional 48 year sentence uh, separate from his death sentence for five other counts. And I just couldn't read off the accounts. I just couldn't list them off. Um, My heart just hurts. Um, It's disgusting. He's still on death row right now Um, in August August 22nd of 2022, so 22222. Um, the Ohio Supreme Court rejected Whitaker's appeal and Good. upheld his death sentence. Good. His execution is scheduled to take place in July of 2026, so in three years. Ohio has not ed- executed an inmate since 2018 because the state has not found a replacement for lethal injection yet. Right, there is currently a moratorium on executions, which I... Agree with. Right. This is a specific case that I just, I stand by. He deserved the death penalty a thousand percent. I think the death penalty should be 100% reserved for the most egregious acts of evil. And this is it. And this is it. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty anti-death penalty. Yeah. For the most part, because number one, I don't feel there's a humane way Mm -hmm. to administer the penalty itself. Mm -hmm. Um, The number of black men that have gone to their deaths who were innocent. Yeah. And so, but this one, I'd, I'd push the button myself. Mm-hmm. This is disgusting. Mm-hmm. I can't fathom it. I just don't have the ability to I understand. Didn't even, I didn't even fully describe. I'm glad because I was getting yeah. nauseous. I'm, I'm, I'm physically ill over this. Um, my heart, I don't know if my soul can really like recover from this research. Um, and I don't say that lightly. This is one of the biggest cases that has ever touched. Like I'm, I'm finding it hard to find the words for how much this, this case has, has touched my soul. I I can't look at her face without wanting to hold her and cry. Um, I think too, is that we, we all remember, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners do being a 14 year old girl. And encountering scary situations. I was 13 and still playing with Barbies when a man came up to me and grabbed me off the street and raped me. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I remember putting I remember putting my Barbies in a box and saying I'm too old now. Yeah. I was still 14 playing with dolls, by yeah. the way. Aliana's family later filed a wrong, wrongful death suit against Aliana's school for failing to notify them of her absence. Good. Absolutely. Absolutely. fucking I'm shocked they didn't. I because think it's uh, her, unconscionable. Her death was so prolonged. The violence that took place in that abandoned house was hours. That girl went through hours of torture. Had that family been notified, Maybe they, they could have found they could have found her in time. Oh, I know they could have found her in time. My they found her really me. fast. Yes. Yeah. With very little evidence to go off of. They found her. I just know that they could have if they were given the time. So um, they so, yeah, they they the lawsuits were dismissed at first. But in 2019, the the Aliana alert bill was signed and put into law. So uh, K through 12 schools, all K through 12 schools in Ohio are now required to notify ch- parents of a child's unexplained absence within two hours. I still think that that's a little bit too long, but you know, <laughs> um, I think I just have a little bit too feelings involved, uh, too many feelings involved, but I, I am proud of them for, for taking the stand for making this change for, like the, her parents have literally gone through the list of things that could have saved her in this instant and have fixed it. They have fixed the public transportation systems for children. They have fixed um, their their police presence in their communities and they have fixed their schooling. And um, I just I'm really proud of them for all their hard work. I can't imagine I would just be uh, completely immobilized. And um, they 
they applied themselves. They applied their love. And for I just her. don't know how they managed to do that because I would be just destroyed by right. this. I would be destroyed. And they were. They absolutely were. And they um, rose back up and they fought for her. They and I used think that is their so love admirable. for her. And to do protect we have other children. Is there anywhere we can donate absolutely? Okay. Um, there is the the Aliana DeFries Foundation is on Facebook. It has all of um, I think it's Watanya's information. Um, it has her email address, her phone number, um, everything that you need to know is right there on the Facebook page. Excellent. Mm-hmm. There's some misinformation through Google. You, you, if you Google it, you'll see because there's a lot of links that don't work. So I have the Facebook page for you linked. Oh, awesome. Um, so definitely, definitely look at that. Definitely look at um, our Instagram. I'll be posting even more in- links and information on our Instagram and our story as well as our Patreon. So definitely look at that. All of the pictures will be on Patreon. Trigger warnings ahead, but um, um, yeah, and keep in mind that those are you don't have to be a patron to look at those, y'all, because we didn't take those pictures. We yeah. had to put it behind a paywall. Yeah, and it's it's kind of helpful to look at the pictures as we speak about it, so that way you can kind of get a visual. Yeah. I'm a visual learner, so um, yeah, yeah, and uh, good job centering the victim on this one. I know it was hard because this was terrible. I couldn't look at him. I didn't want to know anything about that man. I didn't want to know. I didn't give a fuck what his background was what who his parents were when he was born no there's Mm-mm. no amount of horror no. visited upon another no. human being that could turn them into somebody who would brutalize a 14 year old child the, of diminished capacity and the way he spoke in his in- interrogation just proved that he was of sound mind he knew exactly what yeah. he was doing the way he was speaking he just didn't care yes it's just empty the brutality that he inflicted i can't that wasn't drugs sir that was evil. That was pure fucking evil. And that's, as, as her grandmother said, you know, she wants the world to see what evil is. And that, my friends, is what evil is. So let's look after each other. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And, you know, maybe look at your own town and how kids are getting to school. How can we implement? How can we do it before it becomes that we're doing it in somebody's memory instead of being proactive about that it? That is what was plaguing my mind all fucking day. I kept saying that to myself all fucking day. It's like, why do these cases have to exist? Why can't we just look out for people before this happens? A little girl should be able to go to school. Period. Those Those safety precautions should already be in place. Yes, we, we shouldn't should already... have to retroactively. Yes. Because somebody did this to a baby. We yes. shouldn't have to do that. There should be no more. Not one more. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Hey, listen, y'all, I know this was a rough one, but I want to thank you for tuning in today, for yeah. listening, for being supportive. Me and Willow have been really going through it in our personal lives right now. Yeah. We are both just worn down to like the frayed edges of our nerves everything's okay we're okay we're yeah. safe and we're good but the the patreon episode that is coming out soon is also way more than just a meme y'all it is heartbreaking gut-wrenching and uh it's Important. been it's been a lot of it's been a week uh two weeks of really really hard research yes and i and i do it proudly because i just really want justice for these people uh um, doing the scott peterson research yeah. The case is disgusting. What happened to Lacey? Mm-hmm. And I just, somebody you trust doing that to you, I can't fathom it. But these cases are important, and I would like to have you all on over to Patreon, yeah. and so please pay us a visit. Otherwise, I am just going to end this by saying, hey, we love you. Thank you. Thank you, and good night. us on your social media platform of choice. Linktree slash cruelty has all of the links. Check out our Patreon for exclusive episodes, merch, ad-free episodes, live ghost hunts, and much more. Please be sure to subscribe. New episodes are uploaded weekly. Thank you so much. See you next time. Music and production by Levy.